initially obvious by now. I've lost my voice. So if you want to see this talk with proper audio, leave the room. Go out in the lobby and stream it from conference, because I'm going to just talk about the last. Otherwise, please be nice. <laughs> and please be quiet. Keep the rustling and the piping and everything else to a minimum so that I don't have to use any more voice than I need to. And like, this is going to be an adventure for both of us. So, GoGo Roku 2010 was my first tech conference. Jim Weiber gave the keynote, and he covered a wide variety of topics, including physical chemistry, emission spectra, and this book. He had had this book recommended to him by many other nerds, and he talked about a study group he set up to go through. He demonstrated the content for the first two chapters, and then at the very end, he pointed out that everything in the 90-minute talk he had given hadn't used assignment. And that talk by Jim Weirich is the inspiration for this talk. This book is the structure and interpretation of computer programs. It was the Programming 101 book at MIT for a very long time. It is wonderful. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm Asha Hammerly. I'm begging my sorry to be on Twitter. I like it when people tweet at me during the talks. My phone is down there, so you can't interrupt me tweeting at me. Um, I'm Thagomizer, I get up, and I blog hopefully more frequently in the future at Thagomizer.com. Um, I'm not an expert on this stuff in any means, but I have been part of three functional study groups as part of Seattle RB, and I'm interested in the esoteric and academic parts of programming. <coughs> and I'm truthfully seeing functional programming all over the place. That right before this talk, I was reading Twitter, and someone pointed out that all of the not Ruby talks at RubyConf this year are about functional programming, and that that might be a hint. <laughs> so, functional programming, what's that? Here's the Wikipedia definition. Computer science functional programming is a programming paradigm, a style of building the structure and elements of computer programs that treats computation as the evolution of mathematical functions and avoids state and meaningful data. This is a comment from one of my coworkers who I respect a lot. The idea of mutable state is suspicious and easy to mess up. And these are Jim Weir's definitions from the talk I was mentioning. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on one aspect of functional programming, and that is not using mutable data structures. So there will be no assignment in any of the code in this talk. There will be not a single, single equals in Ruby. And there's a lot of scheme in this talk, and in scheme you use set bang. So there will be no set bang. And if modifying an object seems important, we'll clone and create a new one instead. Setting expectations are 112 slides. Lots of code, lots of parentheses, and no ponies. Sorry, Carrie. Why should I care? So, functional programming is powerful. First of all, it's easier to test. There's less setup, less stubbing and mocking, and you always start from a new state. Previous tests can't pollute the state for, your, for the next test. Functional programming supports concurrency very well. If nothing's modified state, it doesn't matter how many threads you have because you don't have to deal with blocks on shared resources. Reduced systems frequently use functional programming techniques. When your code um, it doesn't modify state, it's always safe to reuse it if your programs are other parts of the same program. Brevity. Functional programs tend to be very brief and very concise. Some people think this is awesome. I am one of them. Some people think this is an I am not I'm sorry if you are. Um, you already use it. Ruby lends itself very well to functional techniques. And you're probably using these techniques badly without knowing it. If you do any JavaScript, I guarantee you're writing some functional stuff, functional ish stuff, and doing it badly. So you might as well do it right. And learning it. And Ruby is easy. It's easy to apply these techniques to Ruby, and I find that when I'm learning a new paradigm, it's best to do it with language I'm already comfortable So, I'm going to do this talk half in Scheme, half in Ruby. I believe everyone should be able to programming languages polyglot. To make it easier, I've got my slides laid up side by side. Ruby is on the right and in red, because they all start with R. Scheme is on the left and in blue. So the first thing you need to know about Scheme is that unlike Ruby, it uses prefix notation. That means the operator comes first. So instead of 5 plus 3, you have plus 5, 3. 
and you're like, well, that's kind of lame, except when you look at the next line and you see that you can do one times, two times, three with only a single times using this kind of technique. Very powerful. Grouping is pretty obvious. You know what happens when you can group things with parentheses. And you can call named functions, not just mathematical operators, the same way that add one as a successor function for numbers. So you can define functions. Define function name and then argument. So we're defining a function called square n. And then inside the after that is the body, times n of n. And then, like we have def and end, and we're going to use parentheses in the scheme to denote code blocks um, grouped. So the close parentheses is equivalent to the end. And then again, we call that with the function name and then the argument in parentheses. Conditional scheme has several conditionals, and I'm going to use con throughout this talk. It's like case in Ruby. So this is the definition of absolute value. If our argument is less is greater than zero, we return our argument. Is equal to zero, we return zero. And if it is less than zero, we return the opposite of it. This is another place where prefix notation is awesome because I can do a unary notation exactly the same way I would do a subtraction. And because the last time I gave this talk, this blew people's minds. Yes, you can do this in Ruby. You don't have to put something after the case. If you do this, it just evaluates each of the clauses in the winds and it falls through to the first one that's true. And since everything is truthy or falsy in Ruby, this works great. I use it all the time. I learned this from the more senior programs of Seattle RB. Add this to your arsenal if you take nothing else from this talk. <laughs> so back to our conditionals. Um, this is a slightly modified version of the scheme side. This is how the real schemer would write it. It's much more condensed. I think it's pretty. You might think it has too many parentheses. It's okay. You'll get over it. Because <laughs> um, people asked, you also have an if in the scheme. This is defining a predicate function only. A predicate function is a function that returns either true or false. <coughs> if uh, the temperature is greater than 65, it is only. Pound T in Ruby in scheme is true. Pound F in scheme is false. And you can see the Ruby on the other side. These are exactly the same code laid out the same way in two different languages. I sound awesome. <laughs> So uh, most functional languages heavily use lists. In Scheme, we represent lists with a quote, an open parentheses, the elements of the list with no commas. This always messes me up when I'm switching back and forth between languages. And then a close parentheses to close the list. I'm going to represent lists in Scheme by arrays in Ruby. They are not the same at all. If you know Scheme, I'm sorry. But this was the easiest way to make the parallels for our purposes of this talk. So, um, most functional languages make heavy use of firsts and rests. Car is first in most Lisp dialects. If you want to know why, ask Wikipedia. I don't have the space and voice to explain that right now. Car is just first. Note it's prefix notation again. The function goes before the list. Um, Cutter, CDR, is rest. In Ruby to get rest, I have to do one dot dot negative one. That's gross. So I'm just going to assume that rest exists. And when I was actually building these slides, I reopened array and added the rest method and set it equal to the equivalent of self, one dot dot negative one. And when you're doing things uh, with lists, it's often helps you to know if your list is empty. We have empty A in Ruby. We have null A in scheme. I am using the Canadian pronunciation of the question mark there, if you've not heard that before. Um, and knowing if your list is empty is really important for recursion. So let's do this, the canonical recursion example that you see all the time, factorial. Here's the standard recursive definition of factorial. If our argument is 1, the factorial of 1 is 1. So we return that. Otherwise, we return the number times the factorial of the number minus 1. Scheme and Ruby side by side. Here's the other canonical recursion example, Fibonacci. If our number is 0, we return 0. If our number is 1, we return 1. Otherwise, we return the sum of the number minus the Fibonacci of the number minus 1 and the Fibonacci of the number minus 2. This returns the nth fib number. So now I'm going to go into something slightly more complicated called tail call optimization. So this is exponentiation. Um, 
And specifically, this is taking the number B, the base, if you remember your uh, seventh and eighth grade math, and raising it to the nth power. Anything raised to the zeroth power is one, so that's our base case. If n is equal to zero, we return one. Otherwise, we multiply our base times b to the n minus one-th power. So this has a small problem, though, is that the stack ends up looking like this. It gets more and more because we're saving off these, if I'm doing two to the fourth, we're saving off these two times, two to the third, two times two to the second, two times two to the first, two times two to the zeroth. And we can reduce this stack depth with, or this stack size with an idea called tail call optimization. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a helper function. I'm calling this x-t, and this has an accumulator. So we now have b, the base, same as before. c is the number of times we need to raise that to a power. It's a counter, which is why it's c. And p is the partial product, the multiplication we've done thus far. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say that if we've, our counter is 0, we've done all the multiplications we intend to do, we're going to return p. Otherwise, we're going to take a recursive call to our helper of b. We're going to subtract 1 from the counter and multiply b times our product thus far. If you've used inject, you've probably dealt with these accumulators as you go before. Um, and if our language supports tail call optimization, this will help our stack. You'll note that our original function is still there. We're hiding the helper. And we're going to call our helper function with the same b and n, and we're going to use 1. That's the, anything raised to the zero is one. That's our base case as the initial partial product. So when we run this in a language that's tail call optimized, this is what our stack ends up looking like. We don't end up accumulating those two times that need to keep going. So we don't have as much stack to unwind, and it uses less space. So this is a semi-contrived example that I'm going to go into now. Um, this is my favorite thing to test a new functional language on. I'm part of a study group with Seattle RB that we just finished on a book called Build Your Own Lisp in C. And we were building a language that, if you squinted really hard, it might have been a Lisp. Um, it's a really good book. I recommend working through it, but it's not going to teach you Lisp. But one of the last assignments was write a functional program using this Lisp-ish language. So this was the one I chose. Um, it's a little more complicated than some of the stuff I've shown, shown you, which is why I like it. And I think it's kind of cool. And the problem is making change. It comes from the structure and interpretation of computer programs, that book I referenced earlier, chapter one. And the book phrases it this way. How many different ways can you make change for a dollar, given half dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies? And this is too complicated to dive straight into. So the first thing you do is you want to simplify that. And I end up with, how many ways can you make some amount with some coins? And this phrasing is way more simple and way more general. And from this, I get a basic function outline. I'm going to define a function count change, and it's going to have two arguments, amount and coins. I'm going to say that amount is the number of cents. If you've any, done any work in programming using money, you know that you almost always want to represent it as an integer number of pennies, because dealing with floats when you can only have two uh, di digits of precision is a pain. And I'm going to say that coins is the list of coin denominations. I'm going to assume that I'm living in Fort Knox, and I have an infinite number of any given denomination, but I have a set set of denominations. I'm also going to assume that my denominations are in descending order by uh, value. So back to my phrasing before. <laughs> How many ways can you make some amount with some coins? Well, that's still hard enough that I can't figure out what the first line of code to write is, so I'm going to simplify again. How many ways can you make one cent in using no coins? This is the audience participation part of the talk. How many ways can you make one cent using no coins? Yep. So that makes it easy. I'm going to have a case statement. And if I have no coins, I can't make change. So let's try running it again. One cent, because our amount, that first argument, is an integer number of cents. And my coins is a collection of denominations, so it's an empty list. Zero. Awesome. Because I am limited to slides and I wanted to keep these in the realm of readable for humans, I'm going to alias count change to cc, just to make it easier to see from now on. So rerun it to make sure that that worked. Awesome. 
Next problem, how many ways can, ways can you make one cent using pennies? Yep, like that. If you feel like you're doing your third grader's homework right now, you should. So we're going to add another case. When the amount we're looking for is equal to the first element of our denominations list, we can make it. We can make change one way. Awesome. Run it. Still works. Slightly more tricky. Five cents using pennies. How many ways? Yep, looks like that. So now things get a little more complicated. I'm going to need to add a case for that. And I'm going to walk you through what this line means in English. If you've taken discrete mathematics or done any combinatorics, this is a pretty standard way of doing it. We're going to assume we're going to use one of the first coin. And then we're going to try to count the number of ways that we can make um, change of the remaining amount. So amount minus coins first is saying we're going to use one penny. We're going to end up with four coins. And we're going to say we're going to figure out how many ways you can make four cents using the same coins. So we run it, five cents. One penny, one, one way. OK, we're doing some good so far. How many ways can you make five cents using nickels and pennies? Yep. One nickel, five pennies. So let's try it and see if our code works. Um, no, that, that's, that's not right. So something went wrong. For most of you, I'm guessing it's not obvious right now exactly what's going wrong, and it wasn't to me. So what I did is I substituted the args in for the variables in the code. And let's look at it one case at a time. Well, the list 5.1 is not empty. The array 5.1 is not empty, so we're going to skip that case. And we have this case here. We're trying to make 5 cents. We have a nickel. So we return 1. Well, that's not right, because that misses the case where we don't use nickels at all. So we need to add a recursive call here. What we need to do is we need to say, OK, it's great that you can use nickel, but you should also try to make that same amount using everything but nickels, which is coins.rest. So let's see if this works. That worked. Great. Even more complicated. How many ways can you make 10 cents using nickels and pennies? Three. Two nickels, a nickel and five pennies, and 10 pennies. Let's see if we got all the gazes down. Uh, that, that's not right again. So again, let's substitute in the arguments and figure out where we're going wrong. Well, we skip the first case again. We skip the second case now because 10 does not equal 5. So there's something wrong in our recursive case, our fallback case. And again, we're missing a case where we don't use nickels at all. And so we need to add that case in. We're going to add the number of ways to make our 10 cents using everything but our first coin denomination to the number of ways to make 10 cents using our first coin denomination. When I was taking combinatorics, my professor called this weirdo analysis. You claim that the first element of your collection is the weirdo, and you count all the ways to do something with the weirdo and all the ways to do something without the weirdo, and you add them together. Um, so if that helps you remember this technique, awesome. I'm sure that he. I'm sure that Professor Levin would be very happy. So we now run a rerun our code. We get three, which is the right result. So now I put my, my QA hat on from when I was doing QA, and I ask awesome questions, such as, how many ways can you make seven cents using only nickels? Well, the answer is zero. And when you run the code, you get this. So that's not right. Also, it's not good. So what's going on? Substitute the args in again. So I've grayed out everything that we skip. And what we end up with is this case where we're going 7 minus 5 is 2. And we're trying to make 2 cents using nickels. And we just keep ending up in this case. So the next time we go through, we're trying to make negative 3 cents using nickels. And then we're trying to make negative 8 cents using nickels. And eventually, we run out of stack. And that's bad. So we think we're missing a case. We're missing a base case to prevent infinite recursion. And that's this case. If the amount we're trying to make is less than the first coin in our denominations array, we should try to make the, the coin, we should try to make that amount using whatever is left in the denominations array. This is where I am absolutely 100% assuming that the coins in the coins array are sorted in descending order. Since I get to decide who calls this and how they call it, I'm going to say that's a fair assumption to make. 
If I'm really worried about it, I can sort that array in a helper function before calling into this recursive code. And if I do that, it works. So at this point, we're ready to tackle the original problem. How many different ways can you make change of a dollar, given half dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies? And the answer is 292. So here's the same code in the scheme. It's exactly the same cases as the Ruby. We have a cond instead of a case. We're using null question mark instead of empty, returning zero in that case. We have a less than, again, with prefix notation, car instead of first. We have the case where our, our amount is equal to the first coin in our set. We're doing one plus, figuring out the number <laughs> of ways to make the amount with the rest of the coins, and so on. It's exactly the same code. More parentheses, but the logic that we just applied to Ruby applies directly to Scheme, and vice versa. You can really tell when you're looking at some of the stuff that Ruby was heavily influenced by Lisps. Because Scheme is a Lisp. I left that part out, sorry. So, a little bit more fun on functions. This is a function called member. In Ruby, we call it include question mark, but every other language I have ever used calls it member. Basically, we're saying, given a list L and something, some item N, is N in the list L. At first, we check and see if we have an empty list L. If we do, then clearly N can't be in it, so we return false. Remember, pound F is false. Otherwise, we take the car of L, the first element of L, and see if that's equal to the thing we're looking for. Well, if it is, then the thing we're looking for is clearly in the list. So, pound T for true. Otherwise, we see if the thing we're looking for is in the rest of the list, the tail of the list. So, pretty straightforward. Here's the exact same thing in a smaller font, because I want to show something very cl clever here. This is me defining the predicate any, which exists in Ruby, basically like this. And I've grayed out the stuff that I didn't have to change. The only thing I had to change was the stuff in bold. And this, is pointing, and this points out to me that all of these recursive functions, these operations on list, end up looking a lot the same. So any, all it does is it takes, instead of a thing to look for, it takes a function that's a predicate that returns true or false. And it find, tells you if any of the members of that list are true for that predicate. Here's the full implementation. Again, we check to see if our list is empty and return false if it is. Otherwise, we see if our predicate is true for the first element, just like we saw if our first element was equal to the thing we're looking for and return true in that case. And if neither of those cases passes, we then go to the case where we try to find out if our predicate is true for the rest of the list. So if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna use anonymous functions. Um, on the left, you see how you define an anonymous function in Scheme. On the right, you see how you define an anonymous function in Ruby. They look a lot alike, don't they? I am using the lambda syntax, not the stabby proc syntax or the proc.new syntax on purpose. Um, and this function, all it does is squares the argument. Uh, in Ruby, you have to do dot call with the argument. In Scheme, you throw an extra set of parentheses around your lambda and put the argument at the end of the, right before the closing paren. So here's me calling our any function with the first, the first line um, a lambda that returns true if any of the elements are greater than five, less than five, that returns true. And the second case, it's turning true if any of the elements are equal to five, and that's false. And so at this point, I'm running out of voice, I'm running out of time, but I intended this talk to be kind of a functional programming 101. In the end, it's actually just the first half hour of functional programming 101, and I highly encourage you to learn more. So some resources. Uh, this is the little schema. This book is awesome. Seattle RB is starting a study group tonight for this book. I highly recommend that you start a study group for this book at your workplace with your friends in your local Ruby meetup. It's easy, it's short, you can read it in a weekend, but I and the book do not recommend that. It has space in it for jelly stains. And it is also written entirely in Socratic dialogue. Um, questions on the left, answers on the right. A number of people who are not at all technical but not consider themselves programmers, I've seen pick this book up and just follow along because it's not intimidating. And it's really awesome. I didn't bring my copy with me, but you should go, you should go buy one.
Ryan has a copy of The Little O. Miller. This book has uh, two sequels, The Seasoned Schemer and The Reasoned Schemer. There's also The Little Lisper and The uh, Little O. Miller. And they're all written in this style, and they're all delightful. Um, this is Destruction Interpretation of Computer Programs. It is also known as the wizard book in the way that computer scientists like to give their very heavy technical manuals very unintimidating names. Um, so I was part of a study group with Ryan Davis and Aaron Patterson about, what, three years ago now, Ryan? It took us nine months to get through this book. It only has five chapters. Um, that should tell you something. It's dense. I also know that I became a significantly better programmer in Ruby and in any other language I've ever used by finishing this book. Just a, a pro tip, we didn't know this when we got into it, don't do every exercise. <laughs> I don't do every exercise at MIT either, so it If you're the kind of person who likes lectures, there are open courseware lectures from the late 80s to go along with this. The sweaters are awesome. Um, <laughs> they really are. I really highly recommend it. If you're more like me and you're an auditory learner, there's a bunch of talks on con freaks that kind of give you an introduction to functional programming. Um, functional programming in Ruby by Pat Shaughnessy at GoRuco 2013 is great. Um, Parenthetically speaking by Jim Wyrick at GoGoRuco 2010 is the talk that I referenced. Sadly, only the first 45 minutes were captured and put online, and that's most of the physical chemistry and less of the nerding. You should still watch it, though, because physical chemistry is awesome. Um, Functional Principles for OO Development by Jessica Kerr, uh, Ruby Midwest 2013. This talk is on Turbo, and I am intimidated and delighted by Jessica on a regular basis. If you want someone who's a little more animated than me, watch this talk. Also really, really, really well done mathematically. I hand-waved a lot of the math. Um, and then Why Not Adventures in Functional Programming was a RubyConf keynote at RubyConf Denver. <laughs> And I was in the room, and I've watched the talk twice because I could barely follow along. And I had finished SICP at that point. But Jim just did an amazing job. You know, little baby steps from this is a stabby proc to, oh my god, I don't understand what's going on anymore. And you should totally watch it. It's amazing talk. Um, photo credit for the pony. Thank you guys for being nice. And uh, I like dinosaurs. Um, I am giving out dinosaurs to folks who teach me something or ask interesting questions. I think I've got about 60 left, so you should come find me at some point. Um, I saw folks taking pictures. Um, these slides are already online on my website because I gave this talk at Mountain West RubyConf. I will also post this version of the slides within the next hour, Fagomizer.com. You can see them. Um, I am on speaker rate if you want to rate this presentation. Other than that, thank you guys all very much. I can probably take a couple questions because my voice is holding out.